This build makes you practically immortal. Any damage you take is immediately restored. And combine this with the fact that you can deal upwards of a thousand damage per hit. Oh, and did I forget to mention that the most important item that brings this whole build together is obtainable as soon as you beat the first boss. If any of this sounds even remotely interesting to you, stick around as I talk you through how to become an unstoppable paladin, able to wield some of the most devastating spells in the game, and manipulate your health to the point where you physically just can't take damage anymore. The first thing we need to do is get through this door at the Blind Agatha Vestige. If you've been following along with the Things You Miss series, you already know exactly how to get here. And to get the key, you simply need to purchase it from Stomond. It is quite expensive at 9,500 Vigor, so you may need to grind a few enemies first, but trust me, it is well worth it. Now, once you've got the key, I'll meet you back at the Blind Agatha Vestige, and let's head through the door. Be warned, if you are doing this as soon as you're able, the enemies through here are very powerful. But there are plenty of flower beds along the way you can use as checkpoints, so that you don't have to do the full run again should you die. Firstly, switch up into Umbral and then head straight forward and down this ramp. Traverse over the wooden platforms, being careful of the planks that will break away here. Once you're at the other side, head left and head round the back here, avoiding all the enemies. This is the first location where you can place down a seedling if you need a checkpoint. Now we're going to head up and keep hugging the left wall. Outside, across the wooden planks and up the spine, just be careful of the crossbowmen at the top. And head left into this room. There is yet another flower bed that you can use here for another checkpoint. And once you're at the top of the ladder, just keep heading up very carefully, avoiding the dog and the knight. At the top of this section, we're going to head right. Just before we get there, be warned, if it's the first time you're doing this, there will be a barrel tumbling towards you, but you can just roll through it to take no damage. Also, as you'll see, there's yet another flower bed you can use as a checkpoint here. As you round the corner with a cage head enemy at the top of the stairs, there will be another barrel barreling towards you here. So again, make sure you roll through it. Carry on up the stairs past the crossbowman, and now keep sprinting until you're out of the cave. Hang left and run to the vestige as quick as you can so that you can rest up before the enemies get too near. That was the hard part. You have now activated the vestige of Deirta, and you are over halfway to getting the most powerful Umbral Eye in the game. Now that you've got the vestige, let me show you where to go, and you can pretty much just run past all the enemies if you want. So start by heading down this hill and turning left. Roll through all the enemies. Be especially careful of the Crimson Rector here. Once you've dealt with him, or more than likely just ran past him, round the corner you will see another Mistress of Hounds with loads of her hounds. Again, you can just ignore them all and head right going down the hill further still. Be careful though because there are a few crossbow wielding soldiers round the corner. Also, don't worry if you die at any point because you do need to be in Umbral to grab the item anyway. Now that you're near the bottom, there will be two shield and mace wielding knights. And in Umbral, there will also be a reaper. If you want, you can completely ignore all these enemies. All you're looking for is this Umbral belly at the back on the left. When you soul flay this, you can then loot the Umbral Eye of Loash. And don't worry if you soul flay it and then die, the loot will still be there on the ground waiting for you to pick it up. So just sprint back and grab the item. You now have one of the most powerful items in the game in your possession. So let's head back to Skyrest Bridge and talk about why. Back at Skyrest Bridge, let's traverse into Umbral and go and speak to Molhu. And now we can socket the Umbral Eye of Loash. The reason this is so powerful is because when socketed as your primary eye, any damage you receive whilst charging a heavy attack will be received as withered damage. And on top of this, your posture cannot be broken, i.e. you will be immune to knockback. So one way or another, your charged attack is going to hit your enemy. So long story short, they hit you, all they deal is withered damage, you hit them back, you restore all of your health, and you deal a tremendous blow to your enemy as well. There are a few nuances to this that the game doesn't tell you, so let me go into detail with that as well. 
and also more importantly let's have a look at the builds that best complement this eye let's now discuss a few important mechanics you need to understand to pull off this build firstly the withered health you regain from your attacks is directly proportional to your damage so though you can use this eye with any build ideally big slow strength weapons are the absolute best way to go and for this reason when you do come across an item that will allow you to upgrade your umbral lamp and you gain a secondary socket I highly recommend the Umbral Eye of Rosamund. This is because when you are retaliating with them charged attacks, you're going to regain an extra 15% withered health. And as you can see here, it pretty much guarantees you will automatically go back to full health every single time you hit your enemy. Another very important thing to note, and I don't know if this is an error with the item description or a genuine bug, but if you try and chain charged heavy attacks together, only the first one will correctly stop you from taking any damage and will only deal with the damage. If you try and go straight into a follow-up charged heavy attack, you will take damage as normal. Judging by the item description, this is a bug and it wouldn't surprise me because there are still many of them in the game. So just be warned, until that bug is fixed, you'll want to do one charged heavy attack, then back off and allow the animation to reset before going into your second one. Now you know how to get the eye itself and you know how best to use it, let's talk about the complementing gear. We'll look at sockets, pendants and rings toward the end of the video. More importantly, you probably want to know my recommendation for a weapon. So let's take a look at how you can quickly and easily get Ravager Gregory's Greatsword, as that is the absolute machine that you have seen me using in all of these clips. This is slightly later in the game, however still technically early game, because by this point I have still only encountered one of the six beacons, so we're still technically in the first quarter of the game. Specifically, you need to be in Lower Calrath at the Vestige of Lydia the Numb Queen. This can be very confusing, so bear with me as I give you a step-by-step -step guide of how to get there. Firstly, you're going to head over to this corner of the room, dropping down all the way to the bottom of the stairs and jumping out, being careful of all the exploding traps at the bottom. I have already cleared out all the enemies in the area to make the guide a bit more straightforward for you, so just be careful of the few crossbow-wielding serpents and the ruiner that will be coming up for you round the corner. So head to the end of this street and then turn right down the stairs. When you get to the giant flaming tree, we're going to go left and up these stairs. Once here, let me deal with this dog and then we'll head up the ramp. Then just head straight forward across the roofs and down this ladder. Down here, be careful of the many flaming enemies, especially the Enchantress. They can be absolutely lethal. Once all the enemies are dead or you have just run past them, head up this big wooden ramp and then go right up the stone stairs. Feel free to just run past the skeleton, and once you've smashed through all this furniture, you'll need to use your lamp to get through the door. Now that you're here, you can push down the ladder, and you have just unlocked a shortcut back to the Vestige of Lydia. Now head back the way you came up the ladder, and make an immediate 180 up these wooden ramps. At the top here, be careful of being ambushed by the mangler, and try not to get quite as mangled as I do. Once you've dealt with them, you're now free to loot this impaled corpse, and you will be rewarded with Ravager Gregory's Rosary. Now head back to Skyrest and hand this over to Exacta Dunmire. You'll need to rest again for his stock to replenish, and now you can finally buy Ravager Gregory's sword along with the Ravager armor set. Even though you get this sword quite early on in the game, as you can see, it has a 30 requirement in both strength and radiance. However, trust me, it is worth the investment. We're going to talk about why now, and then I will give you a few pointers as to how you can meet these requirements earlier than intended. Before we move off the shop window, let me just use this as an example. You can see I have got my Hallowed Condemnation to plus 5 already, and if you didn't know, weapons go to plus 10. So this is already halfway to its maximum strength. And yes, I appreciate it's a short sword, so it will attack quite a lot quicker than Ravager Gregory's sword. However, with that aside, this is a plus five weapon with increased radiance scaling based on the rune that I have socketed to this sword. 
yet it still pales in comparison to a plus zero completely unmodified Ravager Gregory sword. Add on top of that the fact that it deals both wholly and wither damage, it is going to be effective against every single enemy in the game. And now if we look at it in action, the fact that it does deal wither damage and the fact that this wither damage is greatly enhanced when you are doing your charged heavy attacks means that you can pull off the extra special umbral finisher very frequently. And if you didn't know, umbral finishers are a guaranteed way to get very rare, very sought after unique runes. Now let's head to the blacksmith and take a look at the power of this sword when it is nearly maxed out. I will start off by upgrading it to plus 9 and then we'll pause here and take a look at the stats. As we can see, even with me only meeting the minimum requirements and not even min-maxing my runes and gear yet, it has 781 attack power, with 50% of that coming from physical, 25 from holy and 25 from wither. So it's a really even split between three of the four main damage types, making it effective against every single enemy in the game. And now if we take a look at the runes, the only rune I currently have equipped increasing the actual damage is increase strength scaling. From what I can tell from my research, A plus is already the best strength scaling you can get. And as with most RPGs, the more niche the effect, the more effective it usually is. So taking a look at the runes currently available to me, for my third and final rune, let's add charge attacks deal increased damage, because every single one of our attacks is going to be a charged attack. And also, as our strength scaling is already at an A+, we will switch this out to increase physical damage whilst two-handing. This is going to be more powerful than Ixon, which is just increase physical damage, because as I say, the more niche the effect, the more powerful the effect itself usually is. And I have very few diamond shaped runes at the moment, but gaining mana upon killing an enemy is always a great idea because of the fact we are playing as a paladin, we do need the mana to cast all of our holy and radiant spells. So now with our new modifications and improvements, let's teleport to the toughest area I currently have unlocked and show you the power of this sword. And straight away we encounter one of these armoured to the teeth, great mace wielding enemies. And I'm sure most people here have PTSD from these guys. They can be terrifying. They are super intimidating. So we'll start off by buffing our sword with the power of Radiance and charging up one of our juicy heavy attacks. Of course, because of the eye, we take zero damage. We retaliate by healing all of our withered health and we smash him for 1,345 damage. As I mentioned earlier, I will back up and let that animation reset. And due to the fact his health bar is now partially withered, this second attack will do even more damage, dealing nearly 1700. And with that, we can now use our special umbral finisher and bag ourselves another rare rune. And my friends, this is how 99% of your fights will now go once you have this build. It is utterly broken and so ridiculously fun to play. However, before I move on, we're not done yet. I haven't even spoken about the pendants, the rings, or the spells. I don't want to drag this video out too much, so let's see how quickly and efficiently I can give you this information so you can go about doing this build for yourself. As we're taking a look at the pendants, I for sure don't have all of them yet. There are a lot I'm missing here, but that doesn't matter because there are two standouts that are an absolute must for this build. And that is the Relic of Perpetuation and the Pendant of Induration. Take your pick whichever of these two fits your build the best, either increased health or increased defense. From my testing, the health boost you get significantly outweighs the defense boost, so I would advise the Relic, but it's going to vary from person to person and build to build. Next up for the rings, I strongly advise you equip anything endurance or vitality related to increase your equip load and reduce your encumbrance. Because if you want to wear any kind of medium armor set to help increase your defenses, you are going to need a lot of equip load because this sword is ridiculously heavy. And for that reason, anything like the defaced ring, the ring of duty or the ring of the first beast is going to be fantastic. 
However, if your equip load is absolutely fine, then anything that increases strength or radiance will come next. Rings like the Brawn Ring and the Panoptic Ring are both going to be fantastic because they will help you wield this sword at lower levels. As I mentioned, the stat requirements are quite significant, so if you want to start using this build sooner rather than later, these two rings are fantastic for helping you squeeze out a few extra levels. Next up, if stats really aren't an issue to you, then any of the resistance rings will be fantastic. Anything that increases your resistance to status effects, specifically for the area that you are currently questing in. Throughout the game, you can find them all. As you can see, I've got most of them here. The magma ring for increased ignite resistance. The ring of brilliant protection for increased smite resistance. You get the picture. And last but most certainly not least, one of my favourite rings in the game, and also the very first ring you encounter, is the Mine Owner's Ring. Increases your maximum stamina and your stamina regen rate. Both of these things are absolutely fantastic for any action RPG, because stamina management is always such a key aspect of combat. And finally, to round off this build, I really should show you some of the insanely powerful radiant spells that i've been using there are around 20 radiant spells in the game if not more and i'm not pretending that these are the four best radiant spells but they work really well with this build and the four spells that i have chosen give you a really good range of damage healing cleansing and buffing so in no particular order we'll start off with piercing light this is the cheapest of the four spells i use and it's your bread and butter it's a more powerful upgrade of the base spell that all Radiant builds will have, Radiant Flare. Piercing Light, as you see, literally just throws a charged piercing burst of Radiant Magic. And for how cheap it is on the mana cost, it does a crazy amount of damage, absolutely melting this knight and many other enemies before they can even get anywhere near you. Next up, another of my personal favourites, this one I believe you buy from Exacta Dunmire, is Radiant Weapon. And the great news with catalyst buffs like this in Lords of the Fallen, as opposed to other souls likes, is they do benefit from your spell power. The bigger and better your catalyst is, the more extra damage this will apply to your weapon. So it isn't just a flat buff. The better you get at spell casting and the stronger your catalyst gets, the more additional damage Radiant Weapon will add to your weapon. So you can easily do 2,000 damage hits with the right buff stacked once you have this sword at plus 10. Next up, my other offensive radiant spell is Divine Arms. This is dropped upon defeating the Abiding Defenders boss, which is the boss of the area that most of this footage was recorded in. As you can see, it summons a line of blades that will then automatically target and track down any enemy in their path. It can be a bit confusing at first because they don't track the target you're locked onto, they track the target nearest to them. And if you get very good at learning the distance at which these are summoned relative to your character, especially with slower moving enemies, you can spawn these swords on your enemy and they will deal consistent tick damage for every second they are there. Meaning on large, slow bosses, one cast of this spell can deal thousands of damage before it moves. It is broken and can easily be chain cast to one-shot large bosses. It's ridiculously broken. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, you have got Sanctify. One cast of this can easily take you from the brink of death to full health. Not only that, it entirely cleanses and removes all status effects upon you and all of your allies. This is a ridiculously powerful healing spell, and it lasts for far too long in my opinion. It's so powerful. All four of these spells combined with this already ridiculously powerful build make you an absolutely unstoppable powerhouse. And now you know exactly how to cosplay and roleplay as an immortal paladin in Lords of the Fallen. If you enjoyed the video, my friends, please make sure you give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.